Um, this video is going to uh, begin the chapter on muscle tissue, uh, going through uh, the structure of uh, muscle tissue and talking about the sliding filament theory. Uh, now, uh, in an anatomy and physiology book, the early chapters are on the chemical level of organization, the tissue level of organization. And then we start going through the organ systems. The muscular system is an organ system um, because the definition of an organ is that you have multiple tissues uh, working together for a common function. Do we have multiple tissues in, um, say, the biceps brachii? Um, well, we do. Um, since we clearly have muscle cells. Um, but then, uh, as we will go through in just a second, uh, around the muscle cells are connective tissue uh, sheets, collagen fibers and the fibroblasts which make the collagen. So this would wrap the uh, entire muscle, it wraps individual muscle cells. But then obviously uh, muscle is vascular, so there are uh, blood vessels uh, there that not only includes uh, the um, structures of the blood vessel wall, but blood tissue. There are nerves which innervate the, um, uh, the muscles. Uh, and so therefore there are multiple tissue types. So the biceps brachii would be an organ. The semimembranosus would be an organ. Each muscle would then technically um, be an organ. So the muscular system is an organ system. Uh, the chapter earlier in the book uh, reviewed the differences between muscle tissue, and I would just like to quickly mention that again. In, say, Anatomy and Physiology 1, when the instructor uses the term muscle, uh, they're almost always talking about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle cells are huge. They result from hundreds of embryonic myoblasts fusing to form these elongated cells which have hundreds of uh, nuclei resulting from uh, all of those smaller cells which uh, fuse. They can be wide enough to see without a microscope and even feet long. They have this brilliant striation uh, pattern uh, because of the repeating uh, proteins in the cytoskeleton, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, as mentioned before, skeletal muscle is voluntary, although involuntary reflexes can also command it, and it heals to some degree. And that is different from the two types of muscle uh, which this chapter doesn't really cover, but which come up later in an anatomy and physiology course sequence. The cardiac muscle found in the heart is made of smaller cells with only a single nucleus centrally located. Um, it is also striated, but it is involuntary compared to skeletal muscle. Uh, one of the ways you can identify skeletal, uh, cardiac muscle is the intercalated discs, where we have two types of junctions uh, which help hold the cells together, both desmosomes for strength and gap junctions, which allow um, materials to go back uh, and forth between uh, cells. Um, cardiac muscle does not heal which is why you know, car, uh, uh, heart attacks are uh, so serious. Um, then finally, uh, there is another type of muscle known as uh, smooth muscle, which is extremely common in the body, lining most of the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, urinary reproductive tracts, blood vessels, uh, et cetera. Uh, it lacks the striations, is, a non, um, is involuntary, and heals rather well. Uh, and these other types of muscle, uh, they will be more thoroughly covered in anatomy and physiology to coursework. Much of what I say about muscle tissue, um, speaking primarily of skeletal muscle in this chapter, is also true of cardiac and skeletal uh, muscle, but it can be refined a bit going forward. Muscle cells are special cells. They are not average cells by any means. Um, and there are these four features which leap out at us uh, that most uh, cells don't uh, have. So first off, um, muscle cells, uh, like neur neurons, can conduct electricity. They are excitable. Electrical messages can spread over the cell membrane. Now, most cells can change their 
membrane potential. They can depolarize, repolarize. But to have electricity spread along a cell membrane, that's unique to neurons and muscle. So muscle cells being excitable, that is certainly important. Um, all you know, cells have a cytoskeleton where you have you know, actin uh, filaments, you know, if you wanted to compare that as to like the bones of the cell. Uh, and then you have myosin, which can pull on these. And this allows, say, white blood cells to move. All right, you can, you know, move in this direction. Um, but uh, in muscle cells, these cytoskeletal, uh, cytoskeletal elements are arranged so that the cell is contractile. It can uh, shorten. Um, in addition to being contractile, Muscles are also extensile, all right? So when I flex my forearm, all right, um, then uh, not only does the biceps brachii flex, but the triceps needs to uh, extend at, um, at the same uh, at time. So muscles often work in pairs where one can, you know, abduct this body part and uh, the other one can adduct the body part. They do opposing things. They are antagonists to each other. So if one is contracting, one should uh, be uh, stretching. Um, and then finally, uh, muscle cells are elastic and they will return to their resting shape when the contraction is uh, done. Um, and so uh, these are four special features of muscle cells. Now, before talking about muscle cells only, remember that this is an organ that has other components. So there are collagen fibers which wrap muscles, and we can talk about these wrappings in different uh, points. Uh, so there is connective tissue around the entire muscle forming what's known as an epimyceum. So uh, epimyceum wraps the entire um, uh, uh, muscle. Um, then inside the entire muscle, we can find bunches of muscle cells. Uh, and we, the term we use for muscle cells is myofiber. So uh, we have uh, myofibers in the uh, muscle uh, uh, itself, uh, but they occur in bunches. So here you have the entire biceps brachii is wrapped in an epimyceme. But within this muscle would be bunches of individual muscle cells wrapped in another layer, which we call the perimyceum. A bunch of muscle cells would be called a fascicle. So fascicles are wrapped in a perimyceum. And then each individual muscle fiber, each muscle cell, is then wrapped in uh, an endomyceum. And so therefore, we have uh, connective tissue, collagen fibers, and the fibroblasts making it uh, around these muscle cells, uh, forming an endomyceum around bunches of muscle cells. Uh, so a paramyceum surrounds a fascicle, and then around the entire muscle, the uh, epimyceum. These collagen fibers, which we'll see here, you'll see in addition to the striated skeletal muscle, you'll see the nuclei of fibroblasts. Uh, which are making the collagen, and you'll see the collagen fibers as well. These then can anchor into neighboring bones so that when um, you know, a muscle contracts, it can move a bone because the collagen fibers, which wrap around the muscle cells, the entire muscle, they can then insert into uh, the bone and become part of um, uh, of the bone. As bone grows appositionally, it includes collagen fibers from tendons and ligaments. So here's the muscle fiber. Here uh, are the fibroblasts and the collagen fibers that they're making. Um, now notice because of this collagen, this muscle cell is isolated from neighboring muscle cells, um, which is good uh, because if electricity is going to pass over the cell membrane, we want to isolate the electrical events of one cell from the electrical events of other cells. And once again, here we now have a firm junction so that when a muscle contracts, it pulls on a bone because the collagen fibers, which wrap every muscle cell, which wrap fascicles of muscles, which wrap the entire muscle, these then insert uh, into bones and actually become one of the bone since this collagen then becomes a part of the bone uh, matrix. Um, so, 
Um, that's kind of an introduction into the connective tissue. And now to uh, begin with just some terminology. Um, when we talk about the sliding filament uh, theory, it's easy enough, but we'll start using a lot of terms, which obviously need to be defined first. So first, uh, we would say that uh, a muscle fiber is what we call the muscle cell. When hundreds of myoblasts fuse to make this large elongate structure, um, it was a muscle fiber. Inside this cell, we see these very long cylinders known as myofibrils, right? So uh, this is a very long cell, and inside this very long cell um, uh, are uh, cylinders of uh, muscle proteins in these myofibrils. And myofibrils then have a repeating organization. This repeating organization is what is known as a sarcomere. The sarcomere then becomes the functional unit of this muscle cell. So notice that here we have a sarcomere um, and next to another one, next to another one, next to another one, next to another one. And then all of these sarcomeres uh, together, they compose a myofibril. And then all of the myofibrils wrapped in uh, the cell membrane, that forms a muscle cell. And this is why we're going to focus on the sarcomeres and how they contract. Because if we can explain how sarcomeres contract, then we can explain how the whole muscle cell contracts. Since sarcomeres compose myofibrils, myofibrils compo compose muscle cells, and then muscle cells compose the entire muscle. So if we can explain the uh, sarcomeres, uh, then we can uh, explain uh, all of the other um, uh, we can explain how muscles contract. Now, a couple of other terms that we have to introduce. Um, I had said the cell membrane of the muscle cell is excitable. It conducts electricity. And as such, we give it a, uh, a special name. We call it the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma is the excitable cell membrane of uh, the muscle cell. And then um, the cytoplasm of this cell can then be called the sarcoplasm. Sarc is uh, Latin for meat. Uh, and so, you know, uh, a sarcoma is a cancer, uh, which uh, might uh, affect a muscle, for example. So the sarcolemma is the excitable cell membrane. The sarcoplasm um, is the cytoplasm. And uh, we want to be able to connect the electrical events at the cell membrane with those sarcomeres deep inside the cell. So we have these T tubules, which then can conduct electrical messages from the cell membrane down into the cell. So when the cell membrane sends a message, these T tubules take the message deep inside the cell uh, so that the sarcomeres inside the cell can respond. Around the sarcomeres, we have specialized endoplasmic reticulum, and this endoplasmic reticulum is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. It stores calcium, which as we'll see is uh, very uh, important in, um, in muscle uh, physiology. Uh, in addition, uh, if uh, this muscle contraction is going to require a lot of energy, uh, muscle cells also have glycogen, uh, these are the polysaccharide granules, uh, which have an energy uh, store. And then we also have a lot of mitochondria. Mitochondria is where, say, glucose, which is obtained from glycogen, can be broken down for energy. Uh, we might also have um, a pigment making muscle look red, just as hemoglobin makes um, and makes blood looks red, red, myoglobin can make muscle look red. Myoglobin binds oxygen so that uh, uh, muscle cells have glucose, uh, mitochondria where the glucose will be broken down uh, to perform energy, and myoglobin which can store uh, the oxygen needed for this process. Uh, the sarcomere, once again, is the functional unit of the um, 
uh, of muscle. And we say that because if we can explain how sarcomeres contract, then we, in essence, explain how the entire muscle contracts. Because this little sarcomere is a component of the myofibrils. A myofibril is a lot of sarcomeres in a row. And then a muscle cell is a lot of myofibrils wrapped in a cell membrane. So once again, if we can explain uh, the sliding filaments of a sarcomere, we've in essence explained how it is that muscles uh, contract. Now I'm going to say that how muscles uh, contract. Technically, the slightly better way of saying that would be to say that muscles produce tension. So technically, muscles don't contract. They produce tension. If the tension exceeds the resisting force, they contract. So for example, if I try to, to lift you know, a really heavy rock, if I don't lift it because it's too heavy, my muscles are still working. They're producing tension. It's just that my force did not exceed the weight of the rock. So contraction kind of depends on what you're trying to lift. And so a muscle doesn't necessarily contract if you're trying to lift something that's too heavy, for example, as we can discuss in the next video. So um, sarcomeres are these functional units. And so we'd like to define you know, the components of uh, sarcomeres and explain how they can cause a, um, a, a contraction. So sarcomeres begin and end at these regions here called Z-discs. And then coming from the Z-discs are the actin filaments. Now, actin has these subunits which can then be assembled to form these long, um, chains. And uh, notice that each actin filament has a little darker blue spot. That's what's known as the active site where um, myosin can bind. So these actin filaments are anchored in the Z-discs. There's going to be another important muscle protein known as myosin, which has globular heads. These globular heads can pivot towards the center of the sarcomere, and by that I mean that these can pivot this way, this is the center of the sarcomere, and these can pivot this way towards the center of the sarcomere. Um, and these globular heads are actually attaching to those active sites of actin in order to yank on them, right? And so in the center of the sarcomere, uh, we have these thick myosin filaments. Now, because these, um, uh, these proteins have different thicknesses. Uh, when we look at them under a microscope, if they all align, as they do in, say, skeletal muscle, which is a cylinder, as opposed to smooth muscle, which tapers at the end, um, in skeletal muscle, all of these sarcomeres line up, and so then we can see repeating bands or striations on the surface of the muscle, and we can name them if you know we wanted. You know, the A band uh, here. Uh, in the middle with the myosin filaments, uh, the I bands without the myosin filaments, including uh, the Z discs. When muscles contract um, and we pull these uh, actin filaments this way towards the center of the sarcomere, and these actin filaments this way towards the center of the sarcomere, um, obviously then the width of these bands uh, uh, changes. This H band all right, which has you know myosin filaments but not actin filaments, um, then uh, that uh, disappears. All right, and so if we were looking under the microscope and naming these bands for the proteins which we could uh, see, uh, then we would see a change in the width of these bands as uh, the muscle goes from a relaxed state where we see that H band uh, to uh, the contracted state uh, where uh, where we don't. So once again, the Z-discs mark, mark the edges of uh, the uh, sarcomeres. And um, thus, when a sarcomere contracts, we have to pull Z-discs closer to each other. So here the Z-discs are there in pink. And notice that the actin filaments have attached uh, to uh, these um, uh, these Z-discs. Myosin is also attached to the Z-discs through a protein called Titan, which is actually one of the largest proteins known, if that's interesting. But in any case, this actin filament is going to go this way, while this actin filament is going to go that way. And uh, in this uh, way, that they would then move 
towards the center of the sarcomere so that when sarcomeres contract, the Z discs then uh, come closer uh, together um, as uh, the actin filaments on each side are then uh, pulled towards each other. So once again, then here is the goal to take these, this Z disc uh, and this Z disc and bring them closer together because the myosin filaments in the middle are pulling on the actin filaments uh, which are attached to the Z discs. So if you can pull on the active filaments, these ones will move this way, this one will move this way. This will then cause uh, the, uh, the sarcomere uh, to contract. And once again, this is important because since myofibrils are made of chains of sarcomeres and uh, muscle cells are made of lots of myofibrils, if we can explain the contraction of uh, sarcomeres in general, even though they're small, this then in essence uh, describes the contraction of the uh, entire uh, muscle. Right. Uh, so Z discs are the edges of the sarcomere where the actin filaments attach. Once again, um, actin is a common protein. It makes up the cytoskeleton of uh, cells. Uh, there is even you know, actin in uh, the nucleus. Um, um, we have different types of actin genes. So there's you know, different kinds of actin. And the actin in muscle cells uh, are uh, then uh, attached as a uh, long chain. Each of these subunits is an actin subunit uh, with an active site, the darker blue portion. And these long chains of actin then uh, attach to uh, those uh, Z discs. And if you were interested, you know, once again, we have different um, uh, actin genes. And so mutations in different genes can cause uh, different uh, disorders throughout uh, the body. Now, if myosin is uh, prepared to attach and to pull on the subunits of actin, then the question then comes up, well, then why aren't we contracting all of the time? Why are we at rest? And the answer is that at rest, when we don't want our muscles to be contracting, that these active sites of actin are covered. That way, myosin cannot access them and to pull on them. They're covered by a rope-like molecule called tropomyosin, and then another molecule, troponin, holds it in place. So here you see tropomyosin is covering the uh, active sites of actin, and then troponin holds it in place. We control when um, these active sites are open or not, because around the sarcomere, we have sarcoplasmic reticulum, a modified form of endoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium ions. If calcium is released, and this will be discussed um, in the next video uh, because it's uh, continuous with the electrical message which uh, spreads over the sarcolemma. Uh, when calcium is released, uh, then the calcium will bind to troponin. This will move tropomyosin out of the way and now those active sites are now um, exposed. So at rest, um, at rest, this myosin is not pulling on the actin because tropomyosin is covering the active sites of actin and troponin holds, holds it in place. But when the electrical message from the cell membrane comes down the T-tubules, it will then cause calcium to be released from the SR and this then is the signal to start the muscle contraction because the calcium will then bind to uh, troponin. Uh, it moves tropomyosin out of the way and then uh, the active sites of actin would uh, be uh, exposed uh, so that myosin could pull on it. So it is the release of calcium that will start the contraction of the sarcomere. When calcium is pumped back into the SR, that will end the contraction of the sarcomere. So whether or not these active sites are covered or exposed depends on calcium. Releasing calcium causes them, causes them to be exposed, and this will start the muscle, uh, uh, the sarcomere contraction, pumping the calcium back into the SR uh, will then uh, cause this to go back to a uh, resting uh, site a resting state uh, so that the calcium, uh, so that um, the sarcomere will no longer be uh, contracted.
So the way that uh, uh, the sliding filament theory will initiate a contraction is that at rest, the active sites of actin are covered by tropomyosin and troponin holds it in place. When calcium is released from the SR, it will bind to uh, troponin. This moves tropomyosin out of the way. And now the active sites uh, uh, can attach uh, the pivoting heads of myosin, and myosin can pull on them. If we can pull on the actin, this will then bring the Z disks closer together because these actin filaments are going to get pulled towards the center of the sarcomere in one direction and the other actin filaments in the opposite direction. These globular heads of myosin, they follow a cycle known as the cross bridge cycle. The first thing that they do is that they will attach to the active sites of actin. So these globular heads then attach and they form what's called a cross bridge. So this globular head of myosin has attached to an active site of actin forming a, a cross uh, bridge. It will then pivot towards the center of the sarcomere, all right? That means that these will move towards uh, the left, um, but then uh, there is another set of actin filaments being pulled towards the right, either way going towards the center of the sarcomere. So the globular heads will then pivot towards the center of the sarcomere. And since they wanna then do this again, they need to detach um, uh, from these active sites, but to do so they need to bind ATP. So we need to generate a lot of ATP in muscles so that these myosin heads can detach from actin and then return to the ready position. So they bind ATP, and if you remember, ATP has a high energy bond where uh, that last phosphate uh, is storing energy. So when we break that last bond, the energy which was stored there can uh, allow the myosin heads to go back to that cocked and ready uh, position. Uh, so uh, they return to the ready position. And now this cycle can simply be repeated of attach, pivot, detach, return, attach, pivot, uh, detach, return. And so this is what's going to pull uh, the, um, uh, the sarcomere uh, closer uh, make it uh, contract as the uh, myosin uh, heads pull uh, the Z disks closer uh, together, okay? Um, so once again, uh, the beauty of muscle is it's not that complicated. If, and we need to simply try to explain the sliding filament theory accounting for the contraction of the sarcomeres. So we have actin, uh, notice all of the actin subunits, are attached to Z disks, and at rest, they are uh, then covered by uh, tropomyosin, this rope-like molecule, and troponin holds it in place. Now, when calcium is released from uh, the sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum, uh, it binds to troponin, and this then allows tropomyosin to slide out of the way, and now the active sites are uh, exposed. Myosin's globular heads can not only pivot, but also can bend in the middle so that it can reach up, grab actin, and yank on it. And now that the active sites have been exposed, once calcium moves the troponin, now the uh, myosin globular heads can attach to the active sites, pivot towards the center of the sarcomere, detach after binding ATP, and then return to the cocked and ready uh, position. They can then attach, pivot, detach, return, attach, pivot, detach, return. And then this cycle, this cross bridge cycle for the globular heads of myosin, this will simply repeat itself until uh, the calcium has been pumped back into the SR, at which point now uh, the muscle then goes back to its resting state. So that was a description of the sliding filament theory, which is much of the, the first part of this chapter on muscle tissue. Um, in the next video, I'll uh, talk about how it is that nerve cells uh, can uh, influence the release of calcium from the SR, and then other parts of muscle physiology, such as exercise uh, and the amount of uh, force which is generated.